that the World Health Organization uh, first put forward as possibilities as to how this uh, coronavirus came to be. And the two that are uh, currently being most widely discussed are, of course, the zoonotic transmission, meaning it's uh, skipped from animals to humans. Uh, and then the theory that the WHO, after their uh, field investigation dubbed as the least likely, uh, is the lab leak theory. Uh, lab leaks do happen occasionally. We, ha we can go to 1977 looking at um, the Russian flu, which actually did not uh, or originate in Russia at all, but was linked to, to China. Uh, we know that lab leaks can occur, but it was dubbed to be uh, not the leading theory due to the fact that almost all coronaviruses that we are currently aware of, SARS, MERS, etc., have made uh, a zoonotic leak and that this spillover then was thought to be more likely. So through a science lens, uh, this has been the leading theory. However, when we start to look at the picture more holistically, and particularly through a security lens, the fact that the WHO wasn't allowed into the country, because they have to be invited by the government, uh, by Ch the Chinese Communist Party, for at least a year into the investigation, means that there have been some suspicions that perhaps there's more to the story than what uh, just we are able to tell from the genomic sequence itself. Rasmus Nielsen, last year, when the possibility of uh, the lab leak was raised initially, it was instantly dismissed as a conspiracy theory. Now it has gained steam. What made you sign the letter calling for further investigation? Well, um, I'd like to say first that I think that um, we still have a theory of a sonotic transfer that I, I don't think that we can dismiss uh, so easily, for example, using arguments uh, about the way uh, the Chinese Communist Party or the Chinese government has been suppressing uh, information. I think we see that uh, uh, today uh, through the actions they had on the WHO team and uh, various other actions. But we have to understand that it might be part of a, 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 an attempt uh, from the Chinese government to simply control the entire narrative about COVID-19, not necessarily because there was a lab leak. So I think we shouldn't just jump to the conclusion that because China behaves as if it has something to hide, that there actually is something to hide. It might just simply be an attempt to tightly control, particularly with respect to their own population, the narrative about COVID-19. I think there are many arguments that you could give for why it is not a lab, lab leak. And I think the most important argument is that humans get into contact will the bats and other natural sources of viruses all the time. Why is it exactly that the virus that was in the lab that would then cause the pandemic? Uh, it's a very, very little fraction of the amount of human virus contact. I still think that that's a strong argument. When we decided to go out with this letter anyway, despite these arguments, is I would say there's, for, for me personally, and I can't speak on, on, on behalf of the other people signing the letter, but for me personally, there's two reasons. The, the first one is that we realized that the kind of research that's been done at the Wuhan Institute of Virology has been done in BSL-2 labs. That's very low security labs. There's a lot of talk about one of the few BSL-4 labs uh, in China is in Wuhan. I'm not so concerned about that. I'm concerned about that we know now all the coronavirus research was done in a BSL-2 lab. That's not much more secure than sort of your average high school chemistry room laboratory. The other reason is, of course, that we were disappointed with the WHO report. We had hoped that we wouldn't have to go out and insert ourselves in this debate, that there's an, a process going on trying to investigate the origins. But it's clear that with the WHO report that there wasn't a real fair process really trying to engage in a balanced way on trying to find the origins of the virus. So we felt it was necessary to go out and remind people the lab leak theory is actually still on the table and we really should investigate that theory so we can better be prepared for preventing the next, next epidemic uh, from emerging. Indeed, very interesting points. Uh, Amy Shadalja, the only investigators who got some kind of access to the Wuhan laboratory were those from the World Health Organization. But then this team was handpicked by China, as we all know, and their probe was more of a guided tour. Uh, what do you make of the WHO uh, investigation report, and do you find any obvious gaps in it? 
most of us in the field realized that the WHO report was not going to be conclusive, that it was going to be tightly controlled and heavily influenced by the Chinese government. So whatever the conclusion was, it wasn't going to be something that actually pointed to a path to understand the origin of this virus and how it went from bats into humans. So it was immediately discounted by many in the field as being biased and, and having a lot of conflicts of interest with, with researchers who are doing research with the Wuhan Institute of Virology on that panel. So it, what it really underscores is the need for an independent, transparent investigation, which may never come, but that's what's needed to understand how this virus found its way from bats into humans and then uh, started a global pandemic. Monali Rahalkar, uh, the Wuhan seafood market was earlier considered to be the original source of the virus, ground zero as they call it. Uh, but when you began your research last year, digging into Chinese papers, you found circumstantial evidence, I understand, suggesting a link between the pandemic and the Wuhan laboratory. What did you find? Yes. Yes. Uh, so picking on this, uh, I would like to say that uh, when we started the research last year, uh, one year ago, uh, we found an evidence that there was a mine in a mine shaft in uh, south of China. The, the south of China is hotspot of hotspot for the horseshoe bats, which are the uh, uh, reservoirs for the uh, SARS-CoV-2 and also SARS-1. So uh, there were six miners which went to the uh, went to clean this mine, which was filled with bat feces, and they got uh, severe pneumonia. Uh, we uh, dug uh, deeper into this and uh, there was a uh, Chinese master thesis found by a drastic member called Seeker and um, eventually when we published a preprint uh, we joined this particular Twitter group and uh, studied the master thesis. Now the pneumonia symptoms were very similar to COVID-19 and the fact that um, uh, Wuhan Institute of Virology visited the this particular mine uh, from 2012 to 2015 and brought several samples from there including nine SARS-like coronaviruses. So this is like a circumstantial evidence evidence that so many SARS-like coronaviruses, including the nearest neighbor of present SARS-2, were being brought to WIV, they were being researched, and uh, RATG-13 was also sequenced in 2018, whereas they told us that it was sequenced in 2020. So uh, this is the link from Yunnan to Wuhan, uh, Wuhan Institute of Virology, and uh, so I think we should uh, go deeper into the uh, lab hypothesis because there are several such evidences. Rasmus Nielsen, uh, Peter Dezak was part of the team that traveled to Wuhan and his organization, the EcoHealth Alliance, as we've all reported uh, repeatedly, has funded research at the Wuhan lab through American grants. Was the WHO investigation tainted by conflict of interest? I mean, I think it was unfortunate that uh, collaborators, long-term collaborators with Wuhan Institute of Virology was on the WHO team. I think now in hindsight, I think the WHO must also be able to see that because it would raise further doubts on uh, and raises issues about the credibility uh, of uh, the report and the objectives of the mission. Um, so I would agree that that was unfortunate. Amy Shadalja, uh, reports say that the WHO team spent three hours in the Wuhan laboratory and they were unable to examine any of the safety logs or uh, records of testing on its staff. How do you think they concluded that a lab leak then was the least likely of possibilities? It's really an arbitrary conclusion on their part. They didn't really have the evidence to be able to say that. And we know that what they were granted access to was very limited and very controlled by the Chinese government. And it's it's more than lab logs. They need to actually speak candidly to some of the individuals who work there to ask them what type of biosafety procedures are in place. Did anybody get ill? Are there medical records there of people who got who got ill in November that we heard about in the Wall Street Journal? I, I really don't think that anything that the WHO uh, panel concluded can be taken at face value. It really is is not an objective investigation. It is an investigation that was heavily tainted by, by the Chinese government and not something that was ever going to get into the origin of this virus. And it really should just be dismissed as, as something that was more of a show inspection, a show investigation than actually one that was substantive or probative. Monali Rahalkar, one of the reasons why the lab leak theory is being taken seriously is a 2012 incident when six uh, miners went to a bat cave, as you said, and fell sick. And it is believed that the samples found from those mines are the closest in lineage to the current virus. What do we know about these samples uh, beyond what has come in the, 
in, in the news and uh, have you found anything that suggests that these samples were being manipulated in the Wuhan laboratory? Okay, uh, so regarding the samples, uh, initially Wuhan Institute of Virology told us that they only collected the samples between 2012 to 2013, but later uh, Zheng Di Shi uh, added in an addendum to her nature paper that was in November 2020, 11 months after the pandemic, that she told that they collected uh, two more years, uh, they went there two more years and they collected samples. She also, uh, I think, told in a webinar for other people, so there is no chance, you know, that other other people entering this particular uh, mine. So all these samples were brought to Wuhan Institute of Virology. RATG13 uh, virus was sequenced in 2018, so taking backbone of a virus and then spike of another virus and testing them in humanized mice. So uh, I mean, one hypothesis could be that if RATG13 was used as a backbone sequence and then uh, either by serial passage or, you know, by synthetic um, uh, creation of the virus, uh, if some other virus could have been made, then this could have uh, led to uh, the current SARS-CoV-2. That could be one hypothesis. Or another one could be that the miners which were um, uh, ill, uh, so uh, did they uh, uh, did they isolate any live virus from the miners or the uh, other live viruses from the other samples? So WIB has not published anything on the mine but, uh, on the mine shaft samples apart from only one paper that was published in 2016. So this looks rather suspicious because they had a lot of samples from there. Right. Uh, Oksana Paisik, the evidence is piling up. A recent report said the three researchers from the Wuhan lab uh, had taken ill uh, in November 2019, weeks before China officially declared its first case. Now, Dr. Anthony Fauci has asked China to release their medical records. What kind of evidence do you think uh, is the American intelligence looking for here? Well, certainly it would be uh, important to see that whether there are still samples of um, that could indicate uh, either antibodies or anything associated with, with COVID-19. But again, it's very unlikely that those samples are um, still available. Um, we do know that these workers, again, um, had COVID-like symptoms and were hospitalized. But then again, many respiratory infections will share similar types of symptoms. So we cannot say based on that evidence alone, but it certainly did raise the alarm amongst many around uh, looking again, not at the wider mosaic. You know, there's certainly uh, more interesting questions being raised, particularly as it was within this facility itself. However, again, the WHO is a UN agency. It represents all member states. It cannot compel China uh, to produce these uh, samples of the health, work, uh, health uh, lab workers, even if they do exist. Uh, so again, this puts uh, the WHO in a very difficult position because bulldozing China, uh, especially Beijing, uh, will not uh, lead towards any more answers. So we do need some sort of diplomatic route forward. Do you think it's too late then to investigate the virus because most of the evidence may have been uh, uh, destroyed or it may be too late to find those samples, as you just said? Well, we still haven't taken the zoonotic uh, theory off the table either. So that needs to continue alongside understanding what the what was going on within that lab, uh, the workers themselves. Were there anyone anyone else in association with those workers that could have been potentially uh, affected? Uh, again, we, ha we only have to go as far as 2003 to see that uh, China's uh, tr track record around transparency, even with that first uh, SARS outbreak, uh, wasn't very good. And, and uh, the previous WHO DG came down hard initially, and, and that really was helpful in ensuring that only about 30 countries were affected uh, by that uh, first SARS outbreak back in 2003. But unfortunately, this is a, a pattern of behavior here that means that uh, it's very difficult to get uh, direct answers. So where do we go from here then? Uh, uh, Amish Adalja, uh this is a question for you. Does the U.S. intelligence uh, have any tangible leads to take this forward? Uh, they have ordered a probe. U.S. President Joe Biden has ordered a probe based on America's internal assessment. Do they have leads to pursue over the next three months that could improve the world's understanding about the origins? 
I am sure they have leads and I'm sure they have sources that they're trying to uh, query about what may have happened in those early days of the pandemic in China. Again, as the other panelists have said, it may be the case that we don't find out what the ultimate origin is, but I think it is really important because this is not going to be the first, the last coronavirus emergency that we face. There's a whole family of viruses there that could threaten humans. And I think it's very important that we understand the origin of this virus. If there is an intermediate animal between bats and humans, we need to know what that is because that will change how we prepare. If this was a biosafety lapse, it also will be important because we can share that, that knowledge with the world because there are many other labs that work with dangerous viruses as well. And we want there to be a norm when there is an accident that people report it, that people learn from it and people correct, take corrective action so it doesn't happen again. So I think that this is very important that we try and understand what the origin is, even if we come up empty, because this should be the international norm, especially when you're talking about a virus that has killed millions of people and disrupted the world. We need to know how this all occurred and what those early days were like. Rasmus Nielsen, it's, it's quite obvious that China is not going to give access until something dramatic happens. Uh, uh, so in the event that the second probe, whenever it is ordered, uh, still goes through the same motions as the first one and the Chinese dictate how it is conducted. What are the alternative ways to investigate this? Because China on its own has been pushing uh, its theories about the origins. It claims that the virus has come from imported frozen foods. Is there any merit to this argument either? So there was a couple of questions. Uh, the frozen food, I mean, it's certainly a possibility. I think it's not a very likely possibility that there was a, a, a transfer of frozen food from a, an epidemic that somehow started somewhere else. It's hard to see a scenario uh, with that. SARS-CoV-2 can, in fact, in theory, and there have been some cases in, in China, uh, transmit through frozen f uh, food. But the, it's arising like that, I think, is not something that most epidemiologists would say is a likely uh, ex explanation. Um, with regards to what other evidence or how else uh, this could be investigated, um, I, of course, as the intelligence agencies, they may have some in information. Uh, other than that, we have to rely on, unfortunately, on cooperation with China. And I want to make a point here in, in terms of the, now we hear a lot of critique in the, of the WHO mission, and I sort of agree with all of those issues that have been raised. But there's also a valid argument that if you don't cooperate with China, we will not learn anything at all. Um, and I, so there's a balance there also to, to consider that perhaps, you know, maybe I'm being naive here, but perhaps we could, over some years, China might open up to uh, more bilateral collaboration on, on, some of these, uh, on some of these issues. Cooperate is a euphemism when dealing with China, I think. Uh, you basically play it by the rules or you don't play at all. Monali Rahalkar, while the Wuhan Institute of Virology has got the world's attention, there are, I understand, other facilities in China that have in the past handled coronaviruses, including SARS. In fact, there's been a lab leak in Beijing in 2004. Are there any other uh, such labs in Wuhan or in China that must be made a part of this investigation, a second investigation, whenever it happens? Uh, yes, I think in Wuhan there were uh, three uh, research uh, institutes. Uh, WIB was one, but Wuhan CDC also worked on bat coronaviruses. And you must have uh, seen a video of um, Tian. Uh, there was a, a researcher who uh, had caught thousands of bats and uh, he was, you know, experimenting on them without any safety um, measures. Uh, so, and even Wuhan uh, University uh, also had uh, um, research on coronaviruses. Uh, there were total 23, drastic as founder, there were total 23 labs in uh, Wuhan with different safety levels. And my uh, main concern about um, this particular thing is that if, even if we find the origin or not, we should try hard, but uh, in order to avoid the next next pandemic i think the safety measures for example uh, they were working in bsl2 and bsl3 labs with such uh, dangerous pathogens and secondly they were bringing this coronavirus samples from remote caves uh, to uh, such a crowded city like wuhan such things should be avoided because if they uh, go on continuing getting all these natural dangerous viruses to uh, wuhan again there could be also a po possibility that a natural virus you know not a lab made one but a natural virus present in some sample could infect human beings in future so i think this all work should be restricted and i think there should be serious thought about this thing
Question of the role of the scientific community and experts. Uh, Amy Shadalja, what do you make of the role of scientific journals, for instance, during this pandemic? In the first year, they aggressively pushed back against even the possibility of a lab leak without, uh, as it turns out, giving it due consideration. What I think happened is that the lab leak hypothesis got bundled together with ideas about biological weapons by intentional use or genetic engineering of the virus. And all three of them were handled by the press as the same hypothesis when they're really distinct hypotheses. So there was less evidence or no evidence for this being a biological weapon or being a, a deliberately engineered virus. However, the lab leak was treated as part of that same line of inquiry and that's why it was dismissed and i think that i think journalists should think about how that was all presented because these were distinct possibilities and i think the rhetoric that was going on in the united states with president trump uh, against china also was influencing the way the press reported on this because uh, it, there was so much acrimony over some of the actions that president trump was was taking the way he was speaking about the virus that i think it all kind of clouded what was a legitimate inquiry into laboratory biosafety in china and the ultimate origins of this virus. Indeed, and I, whether we like it or not, I think politics plays a part in how this narrative shapes up. Rasmus Nielsen, uh, after Joe Biden ordered a probe, China has responded by calling for an investigation into the Fort Derrick uh, lab in the United States. Uh, would you say this is an attempt at spreading misinformation and sowing doubt? And what role do you think the scientific community can play in bringing some sanity into this debate about the origin of the virus? Yeah, I don't really want to go into the rhetoric between China and the United States. Uh, and as you all know, the United States in many ways also not free of false for many things in, the, in, 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 in this world. Uh, uh, I think what we have to do as scientists is relate to the facts and try to see how many facts we can get. And then those facts have to tell us, uh, we, oh, we have to sort of assign probabilities to different scenarios based on, on those facts. But I think it's very important for us not to get caught up in this uh, uh, sort of more political aspects of, of it uh, uh, in the dialogue between the United States and China. Monali Rahalkar, there's a lot at play. The scientific leanings, there are vested interests, there is politics. You've been investigating the origins from the outside. How do you think the next phase of the probe should be conducted, considering that the first one did not deliver very much and uh, we don't see the circumstances fundamentally changing in terms of what each party brings to the table? Yes, uh, we were hoping that, you know, uh, the uh, World Health Assembly would decide something, but uh, right now there is no uh, big decision as such. Uh, and um, I think right now we can depend on the intelligence what um, uh, the U.S. Uh, would put uh, in, into this. Uh, secondly, uh, the, uh, as we have this drastic team, and plus we have a, a group of uh, other scientists who are looking into the origins of uh, this virus, we are looking at the uh, metagenomic data of the early uh, uh, patients and there are some interesting findings um, and so I think uh, we should look at the science and there are uh, you know there are some uh, things which uh, come up uh, uh, one after the other so the open source intelligence um, is working and I think um, so such you know uh, this uh, drastic group detectives or the other scientists which are uh, working um, on this very seriously I think they could get some breakthrough in this along with the intelligence if they uh, put things properly. Like, for example, if we get more details about the samples which were uh, uh, which are present in the blood banks in China, we could know when did this uh, pandemic started, actually, you know, the date. And uh, also uh, the databases which are missing, if they are open, uh, means if, if, uh, if we get access to those. Um, I don't know if they are, they are now uh, in the I mean the right conditions. So, but but still, I think the open source intelligence, the genomics, and uh, the other data is very important to find out more. Right. There are lots of ifs in this story, but I'm glad that the whole world has finally uh, decided to pursue it. And uh, from what we understand, G7 leaders are going to call for a new transparent investigation. I think uh, from this conversation, the big takeaways are that the lab leak theory cannot be dismissed. And we do not see China's response uh, changing fundamentally. So we'll have to see uh, how the circumstantial evidence uh, presents itself and take it forward from there. Thank you very much, all of you, for joining us here on Beyond. Thank, Thank you. you for having us.
one World Trade Center that is the one uh, where the, the impact. The cause of India's freedom for many years. I, Joseph Robinette Biden Jr. America is a constant work in progress. 